I'm excited to get into this and, you know, actually, you know, analyze, take a step back and actually think about all these updates because I didn't really have a chance to, I don't know, absorb everything. So I'm actually really excited to see everything a second time and actually, you know, think about how it's going to impact the game. Okay, here we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Timbo's Tours. And this afternoon, I will be your guide on a tour of archaeology. Today, you'll get the chance to see some of the awesome sights and a taster of what you'll be able to get your hands on. Let's head first to the Caridian Desert for our first stop of Karadet. Found near to the Jewel Arena, this ancient fortress and stronghold once housed Zaros' armies and fell to the ongoing onslaught of Zamorakian forces during the God Wars. Can I just say, presentation-wise, I really like this keynote. I like the screens, the displays, everything seemed well rehearsed, responsive. I just like, as a like, you know, not even talking about the specific updates, I actually thought it was really, really well presented. So anyway, I just wanted to get that out of the way. And uh, yeah, let's do it. Previously thought lost to all Zerosian allies, this excavation site's manager, a certain Dr. Nabinik, knows different. Unlocked at level five archeology span after completion of your first qualification, this is where your journey begins through the skill. Do not fret, however, this is not an exca excavation site just for interns. Hidden in the deep vaults who excavate Zerosian weapons, opulent religious pieces relating to Zaros himself, and unearthed scrolls uh, <coughs> relating to ancient magics. Our next stop... So, a couple things to unpack there. So they've got Zerosian weapons, and they said also scrolls for ancient magics. So, I'm wondering if that's going to be new spells, or if that's going to be... Um, you know, just like, I don't know, something lore related more, but it's all really interesting there. And he just kind of like stumbled over it. He didn't comment on it. He didn't say what they were going to be, but I think it's cool how, you know, how an invention came out, it tied together a bunch of different skills. It changed the metas for basically every single, you know, skilling aspect and combat. It's cool to see archeology span possibly doing the same thing here. Did I try archeology span at Jagex? No, I, I didn't go to Jagex. I wasn't invited. Um, this past year just because they only they only tested it with uh, with EU creators So I know literally nothing about it other than you know what they've said in this keynote Takes us to the eastern coast of Mauritania where some of our more eagle-eyed tourists have already seen this in the volcano We now know modern Mauritania to be dark and full of blood-sucking terrors But what this was once a sour dominant stronghold and the jewel of that was the Iceni settlement of Everlight Thank you Oh yeah, that's another one. Did I get a chance to play archaeology at RuneFest? I actually didn't. So I was just going from kind of thing to thing. So I had meetings in the morning and then I went from panel to game show to being on the keynote reveals. So up to this point with the keynote, I actually hadn't seen the venue yet or actually gone around yet, which was a little bit crazy, but it was just, it was one of those years. And then after that, I spent most of the time just meeting people and, you know, getting to chat with people. So I actually never got to try out archaeology or explore the venue but you know it's all good i still you know i got to see videos and clips on like twitter and stuff of people trying it out and you know everything ends up on reddit anyways so it worked out fine and what you all want to hear about the rewards what treats lie in store for intrepid archaeologists who excavate and restore artifacts in the past you might from the past you might ask well let's get started talking about ancient summoning Deep in the heart of the infernal source, after discovering the secrets and unearthing its treasures, you will learn how to bind the will of powerful demons to you through the summoning skill. Using a binding contract forged with new materials found in the infernal source, with your usual charms of course, you'll be able to bind existing demonic slayer creatures and summon them with all of their own unique effects. I don't have the full itinerary written down here for the tour, but I do have a few sneak peeks. First up, we have the Ripper Demon. The Ripper Demon's passive effect will be to deal more damage to its target for how much health it has. And its scroll effect will be to replicate the Ripper Demon's death jump attack. Next up, we have- The death jump attack is interesting. So my guess with how that's gonna work, and you guys can weigh in too, my guess with the Ripper Demon is it's going to for a mob with less than X amount of HP, it will be able to KO it. So I have a feeling it's going to be something that'll be really good for Slayer. That's sort of the, the vibe I'm getting there. That's what I would guess. But uh, I am pretty excited about that. I think it's going to be interesting. 
I'm going gi to give that, you know, the first thing we're actually giving an update impact to. Well, actually, you know, what? we should scroll up. We should talk about archaeology. First off, you got to give it a 10. It's a new skill. Excitement level, I am going to give it a 9, personally, to me, just because, you know, I think uh, it ties in a lot of loose ends in the game. I'm excited to train it. I'm excited to, you know, go for that 120. I'm excited to just have a ton of new content that's going to connect a lot of things together. So, you know what? I give it, I give it a solid 9. Um, but now, on to the Ripper Demon. Let's, uh, let's get in there. Down we go. Impact. I mean, actually, maybe we should bundle all the familiars together. Yeah, we'll just do that. So we're gonna we're gonna leave that there, and then I'll go through all of them one at a time. I'm kind of hoping that these familiars allow them to rebalance some levels. So an example is if you've got two familiars stronger than a steel titan, I'd love it if they dropped the steel titan to like level 87, you know, and did a bit of a rebalancing, and then they put all these new familiars right at the top. But I don't know if they're actually gonna do that. That's a little bit of like wishful thinking, I guess. But I wouldn't mind them doing that. Have the abyssal demon. The abyssal demon will automatically teleport to its target to deal damage and its active scroll effect will be to tether block and bind your current target. So, this is a weird one to me. I, it will tele block and bind your target. So clearly it's designed for player versus player, I would guess. Like there's no point tele blocking and binding a non-player player. With Spellbook Swap already, I don't see this making a huge difference, but I guess if you PK at revs, you know, it's a little niche thing for you. If you, if you want to do that, it's interesting because they're not really doing PvP content. They're definitely not catering too many updates towards it. But, you know, that's one where I'm not going to complain about it because, oh, it's not exactly for me. You know, let's say let's say 3% of the RuneScape player base does PvP. Cool. You've got a new familiar you can use. I think that's fine by me. I probably won't touch it. But, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it is what it is. I'm definitely not, like, most looking forward to this one, but... You know, it could have some niche uses. Maybe if I'm going for IFB, I'll uh, go for the Chaos Alley pet, bust out my Abbey Demon, and uh, maybe PK some people along the way. Lastly, we have the Calgarian Demon. The Calgarian Demon will be the most powerful summoning familiar in terms of combat stats up to date, and its active scroll effect will be to provide you, itself, and nearby friendly players a critical strike buff temporarily. So they've basically, it's gonna be the strongest combat familiar. You, itself and nearby players a crit buff and i'm wondering how that stacks with multiple players because if you do a 10-man boss and you know every time you have one out you get like a couple percent crit strike that's gonna be insane so I would, I would assume there's some amount of diminishing returns but i like this and i've been saying this for a long time which is just with summoning it's basically can you hit the boss if yes use a titan if no use an Nihil. and i'm so excited to actually have some new familiars that have different kinds of effects that could tie in differently where, you know, the crit chance could be more valuable than a Steel Titan at a number of different bosses, depending on, you know, the actual mechanics and when you need damage. So, anyway, I'm really excited for this. And a lot of people were talking about, you know, them reworking summoning to 120. And I feel like these new familiars, they, they definitely help with that in terms of not needing to rework it to 120 and it just being a good skill by itself that actually has multiple meaningful rewards. So... I really like this. I like the teamwork aspect of it. It'll be cool to see, you know, different teams with different mixes of familiars. I, uh, I love this one. So for me, summoning wise, I'm actually going to give this one, I'm going to give this one a nine out of 10 in terms of impact, because obviously it doesn't change the entire game, but in terms of combat and how it works, I think you're going to see a lot of these familiars all the time in terms of the gameplay and excitement level. I'm also going to give this one a nine and it's not because, I'm you know, summoning is the coolest thing of all time and I can't wait for, you know, more summoning. But it's because we've had the same two familiars to use to choose from for literally three years or possibly even more than that. And I'm excited to have one, maybe even two new familiars to put into the rotation. It's basically doubling the arsenal of familiars I'll be able to use. So that's one that I really, really like. By discovering the teachings and blueprints of Gilliner's own Da Vinci, you will be able to create brand new devices and perks using materials found, disassembling artifacts and materials, excavating during archaeology. First up, we have the ancient gizmo. Covering all three different types of gizmos, such as weapon, tool, and armor, you will need to use ancient gizmos in order to obtain the new perks from archaeology materials. That's not all, however. All nine slots in the ancient gizmo will be unlocked, allowing you to experiment further and find perk combinations and ranks previously undiscovered. So nine slots on the ancient gizmo. So does that mean we get nine, we can put nine different materials in? Because 
That's insane. I think that's what that means. I think that means you're going to put nine mats in. So P5E3 would be possible. We're going to be able to get some absolutely mental, mental combo perks with that. And I'm really, really excited by that. Um, yeah, Aftrock 3 Chroming 3 would be another option. And this is something that I'm actually, I'm very excited about. And the reason I'm excited for it is just, we've had the same best in slot perks for, you know, a very long time, pretty much since Invention came out. They haven't added a whole lot. Um, I was hoping when Anacronia came out that they'd be putting in some new perks and they didn't. Um, I'm really glad to see this. I'm really happy for it. Um, I, I think it's going to be fantastic. I think it's just, it's a way to further customize things because your current meta, like biting is always going to be best in slot. Impatience is always going to be best in slot. Aftershock is going to be best in slot. P4A2. And this allows you to get a secondary perk on all of those gizmos for the perks that are a little bit less good on the damage output front. So you'll actually be able to experiment and get something that actually caters to, you know, what you actually want. So anyway, I really like this one. I'm excited for this one. I'm hoping they do something to like, maybe, I don't even want to say refund perks that people already have, but maybe a way to get like half of the materials back that you put into it. I don't know. I don't know if they'll actually do that, but whether they do or they don't, I think it's a really, really good one. Um, Impact, I'm going to give it, I'm going to give it an eight because, you know, when you're looking at invention perks, you're looking at a couple percent here and there in terms of like damage output. They're not actually going to change the way you like play the game, but it's an update to invention that they haven't done in a long time and excitement level. I'm going to give that an eight as well, just because they haven't given out new perks in a long time. And I'm excited to see just the experimentation aspect, but uh, you guys are also welcome to put your, uh, your out of tens in the chat as well. Um, that's what I think. Next up, we have the XP capacitor. If you've ever wanted to level up your augmented, augmented items faster to either siphon them or to get those juicy level 20 benefits, then this is the device for you. An empty XP capacitor takes some of the item XP you would normally earn from your augmented items and instead siphons it into the capacitor. Once the device is full, it can be traded to other players and they will earn double item experience until the capacitor runs dry. It's like bonus XP, but for your invention items. Another device. Un so this one's really interesting. The XP capacitor. I didn't understand why they were doing it when it initially came out, because you're effectively able to double people's XP by paying a lot of money for this thing. Um, it was a bit of a head scratch for me, but I actually had a chance to speak with some JMods afterwards because I was like, so what's good with this? Like, what, why, why is this a thing? It's item XP, which means it's going to level up twice as fast, which means it's going to give you disassembly XP twice as quick, which is interesting. But the actual reason that they've announced it or they've released this um, just speaking to the, the JMods that actually worked on this project, it's because a lot of the time people don't want to switch up their perks, apparently, according to their own animal analytics, um, because you need it to be level 20 for it to be more effective. So what they wanted to do is give people an easier way to level things up to 9 for disassembly or to level 20. So it's not actually something designed for, like, you know, low-level players to be able to, you know, train invention faster, even though that is sort of a, uh, a side effect to it. It's more going to be... Uh, yeah, just for, uh, you know, leveling up those perks so that it's less of a grind. And I think it all kind of caters into, you know, the amount of prep time it takes to PVM and them trying to cut down on that. And I can't say hate it. I think it's more of a quality of life update than anything else. I think it's smart. I think it's really, really good. So uh, I'm just going to say um, XP capacitor, update impact. I mean, you're basically taking an hour and a half to level up a lance to nine or, you know, whatever it is, or, you know, some, some armor to level nine. You're cutting that down in half to 45 minutes. That's not like a game changing update. I'd give it a six. Excitement level, I'll give it a six. Uh, you know, I'll give it a seven because, you know, it's going to be nice. It's just, it's a convenient thing. It's a quality of life thing. I think it makes the game easier to play and I'm good with it. Unearthed from the past is the Kinetic Dynamo. Not content with just using Guthix Juice to power up your invention needs, the, kin the Kinetic Dynamo will be able to create divine charges by simply running around or surging. Once you've done enough running around with the Kinetic Dynamo, it's char it will charge up, spit out divine charges, and then break. So the Dynamo, to me, it ties into the same thing as the last one, which is just quality of life and the amount of time it takes to PVM. Um, I love that. Surging and moving around is something that you do all the time in game, especially if you're PVMing. And this is a way for, you know, PVMing, which is the biggest charge sink in the game, you can be able to get some charges back while you do that. So uh, I really like this one as well. I think it's sort of the, the same as the capacitor. They just, they want invention to be less tedious to train, it looks like. And uh, yeah, that's another one I'm really happy with. 
I don't think it's going to be so powerful that like you're going to want to spam surge and escape over and over again to get charges. It definitely won't compete with Divi in that sense, but it's a way to get some charges back while PVMing, which will effectively just you know, reduce the amount of time you need to spend actually collecting charges if you're an Iron Man and on a main account, it might drop the cost a little bit too. So I don't know what you guys think about it. I think impact wise, um, I'll also put it as a six, but I know if you're an Iron Man, it's probably like a nine or a 10. And then excitement level, I mean, I'm going to put it in the same as the capacitor. I'll give it a, a solid seven for excitement. I think it's, uh, it's going to be really, really interesting. And I definitely like that because like I've got an Iron Man, right? I've got a hardcore, it's got invention and people are literally like, oh, Ryan, don't augment, you know, this gear or that gear yet because you're not a high enough Divi level to upkeep it. And uh, this Dynamo could be changing that. So I like it. I think it's a really, really good update. It's quality of life, which I know sometimes people like overshadow it or, or don't really care too much about it because, oh, it just changes, you know, this, that, or the other like little things. But I don't know. I think you make enough changes to the little things and you really greatly improve the whole game. So anyway, I like. The final thing to talk about for Ancient Inventor today is the ability to further enhance invention creator tools like the Fishermatic, Hammertron, and Pyromatic. Using the materials found from the past, you've discovered ways to make the tools more efficient and act like level 80 tools to the level 72 tools they act uh, right now. Let's move on to the... So that's a really quick one. Um, just tools going up to level 80. I like that a lot. I think it's sort of the same thing. It's going to speed up your XP rates a little bit. It makes sense. There's going to be a higher charge drain rate, but you know, with all these other updates as well, I'm good with it. I don't think it's like the most impactful thing because currently the tools are level 70, so they're going from 70 to 80. To me, that's one that just probably could have been in the game from release. It makes sense. I give you a six. Excitement wise, I can't say I'm actually that excited for it. I'm not a skiller though, so I'm not trying to say it's not a good update. I'm just saying personally for me, I'm not that excited for it. I'm gonna give it a four, but I'm good with it. Real jewel of our tour today and what we are calling relics. Powerful items from RuneScape history have been rediscovered ah, and it's up to you true. to find and harness their powers. In doing so, you will earn permanent, powerful, passive effects, which are always active. You'll be able to choose up to three of these relic powers and pay chronos in order to change and choose between them. These relic powers are incredible, and here are just two of the 20 plus effects we will have at release for you to get your hands on. First up, we have what we are calling the Abyssal Link, which allows, the play, which allows you to cast teleportation, sprees, teleportation spells without casting runes. However, the spells no longer give XP. And the second one to talk about is what we are calling Slayer Introspection. When you are assigned a Slayer task, you'll be able to choose between either the maximum or minimum amount of Slayer sl uh, creatures you want to kill. Okay, so relics, I'm going to pull up the list of all the relics just because I think it's really, really important to do because a lot of them are, are very, very interesting. Uh, shout out to Chi, by the way. She was super, super nice. Met up with her. Um, okay, here's the list. A lot of these are very, very powerful. I'm just going to read the description really quick, which is relics are one of the core reward spaces for the archaeology skill. You gain them through gameplay, and when unlocked, they are permanently passive buffs for the player to use. Each relic power will have a cost to activate. You'll have a maximum of three active at once. There will be a cost to change your relic powers. So quick note before I talk about these, the list is not guaranteed. They're going to make changes to them. There are going to be a lot more than this as well, but it's just an idea. Uh, the weaker ones will be cheaper to use. The more expensive ones will be more expensive. It all, uh, it all makes sense. So here we go. Oh, you guys want a little computer enhance? All right, we can do that here at the RS Guy Productions, all right? Oh, can I really not? Oh, Twitter, you're the worst. All right, give me one second. And we are back. Okay, that's better. Okay, cool. So, end of the relics. Uh, Fawn of Life increases your maximum health. D diplomo uh, the diplomacy one, I can read. Uh, rep gains are 10% faster. Zerker's Frenzy, um, deal more damage the lower your HP. This one goes really well with Death Word, which is take less damage the lower your HP is. Um, a lot of these are just really powerful. Adren doesn't drain outside of combat. That's going to be great for the more casual player that doesn't want to Adren stall. Basic abilities generate 1% more Adren. Um, I'm just going to look at the, you know, the more critical ones. Not draining run energy. Um, taking a look here. I'll let you guys, you know, run through all these if you want to, of course, too. Conservation of energy is ultimate abilities refund 10% Adren. Um, and then this one gives you 10% maximum Adren too. So these two together means um, you could Zerk on 110% Adren with a Ring of Vigor. And then at the end of that, 
you would be on 30% adrenaline as you Zerk. You could A-pot with an enhanced Adren pot, and you'd instantly be on 60% adrenaline. So uh, things like that are very, very powerful together. Um, there we go. Um, just some other really interesting ones. Teleporting to the center of the abyss, that's always useful. Um, rune pouches never degrade. They give you luck effects, things like that. Um, DG gives you no death penalty. Anyway, all, all sorts of things like that. And uh, a lot of them are, are very, very interesting. And uh, this is something I'm really happy with. I got the chance to speak to some J mods after the fact, and this is something that like I'm, I'm cool to share with you guys. Um, basically, what they wanted to do with these relic effects is one of the things people didn't like about weapon diversity was that a lot of them were like, oh, here's a, this thing has a chance of activating and giving you more damage. And it really, you know, muddies the water in terms of, you know, what's good and what's not good. And especially that's one of the reasons why a lot of people don't use the range combat style is your damage output relies on getting extra adren from a sentry bolt procs. It's random, it's not consistent. Same with the rubies. How often is your ruby going to go off? Um, and that's one of the things they, they knew and they were aware of. And uh, it really impressed me with these relics. All of them are active buffs that are constant and consistent. And they wanted that so that if you're PVMing as you're trying to refine your rotations, you always know exactly what you're going to get. Unlike the impatient perk that, you know, effectively gives you about an extra percent adren on every basic, this one actually will guaranteed give you 1% adren every single basic you do. And that way you can actually calculate it into your rotations and you can plan accordingly for it. So that's one that I absolutely love. Um, and I think it's fantastic. Obviously, there's a lot of power creep. It's strong. And I'm totally fine with, you know, how strong it is. I'm not going like, to go into the nitty gritty of balancing like, oh, this is unbalanced, this is OP. Um, I, I really like the idea of it and I really like the thinking behind it as well. This is one that I was very, very impressed with in terms of implementation because I don't think the random like, oh, you have a 2% chance of this popping off and when it does, you get a lot of damage increase. I don't think those are nearly as fun because you can't plan around them actually happening. So that's my thought on that. I'd love to hear what you guys think. But I think it's absolutely fantastic. So I would actually, I'm going to give this a 10. And I'm going to give this, is that the first 10 of the day? The second 10 of the day for relics. I think they're going to be really, really fun to use. That's just me. I would love to hear what you guys think though as well. But uh, yeah, I'm excited. I'm not, I'm not worried about how overpowered they are or any of that stuff. I just, uh, I think they're going to be really cool in terms of changing how you play the game. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really, really good with them. One last thing. During your time excavating the once lost wonders of the world, you'll come across some powerful artifact weapons, which you can restore even further to become exceptional weapons. If you look now behind me, you can spot one of them, which we are calling the Spear of Annihilation. Alas, my section of the tour is over. Thank you for traveling on Timbo Tours. So this is interesting. New weapons, I'm guessing, that's got to be either a tier 90 or a tier 92, I would guess. But in the way and in the direction that they're trending with these updates, I wouldn't be surprised if it also has either a special attack or a special effect that could be really interesting. So this is one, I don't even know if I want to put it on the list because I'll put it on the list, but we don't know anything about it other than what it looks like, obviously. It looks very cool. I'm excited for that. I don't have a clue where it's going to be used or anything like that just because we don't know how good it is, we don't know what it does. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting. And it's also plural weapons there, too. So there are going to be numerous weapons, whether they're, you know, tier 82 or tier 57 or tier 98. We don't know, but uh, it's really interesting. And something I had a thought of here, which is, um, that was grammatically an absolute nightmare. I'm so sorry. I'm sick. Tylenol is doing the very best it can. Um, this could be a good way to possibly use some of the weapon diversity ideas that were really, you know, good and were actually, you know, well balanced and people are really excited about without actually coming out with weapon diversity where they could put some of those effects on some of these weapons. So anyway, it's interesting. We know nothing about it. So I have no way to know what the impact is going to be. I can't even make a guess because we literally just know the name excitement level. I'm also going to say like, I, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what they do yet, but, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting. It should be fun. My section of the tour is over. Thank you for traveling on Timbo Tours today, but now it is time to hand back to our expedition leader, Mod Osborne. So first off the bat, is this an elite skill? Does it, does it go up to 120? Okay, this is not an elite skill. This is a skill that everyone can play as soon as it drops. And Elfie as and well, I thank you for the tail. And archaeology will be going up to 120 on launch. 
As you can see from everything we've talked about, we've spent a large amount of time, love, sweaty buttocks and dirty mattocks, and packing this skill to the rafters. And more content will be dropping into the skill over the year and beyond. It's worth noting there will be an embargo on all LAMP, STARS, bonus XP, double XP, and other skill boosts until six months after the skill launches. This is good. The embargo is good. And I, I love how, like, on Reddit and stuff, everyone is like, I bet they're releasing a new skill so that they can sell LAMPs. It's like, every time they've put out a new skill, there's been an embargo on, on LAMPs, on BXP, and all that stuff. I like it. I'm glad that they're continuing to do that. It's very important. I think uh, it's, a really, it's a really good, it's a smart approach. It allows there to be competition on either for the high scores or just, you know, seeing who's the best at training this new skill and release. So that's one I am very happy with. I am very, very good with it. So anyway, that's one. Obviously, it doesn't really make it onto the list on the dock because, you know, it's just an embargo on, on XP rates or uh, on, on BXP. But it's one that I definitely like. Uh, we also wanted to remove the barriers from experiencing it. So we'll be raising the skill cap uh, from five to 20 for free to play, giving everyone the Caridet dig site to rummage around in. And if this goes well, then we'll look to do that with other skills. That is a big one. That, you know, he kind of, he, he went over it very quickly, but they want to raise the skill cap for this new skill to 20 for free to play players. And I know like most of us in the chat are probably members because, you know, most of these updates are, are members related, but that kind of ties in with the new player experience, I think, for me, because almost everybody starts out in a free-to-play. And this is something I love to see them doing more of, um, this free-to-play content. And I would love to see them, he said, doing it to other skills as well. I think, you know, for me personally, it's not super impactful. Obviously, I'm a member. I'm Max. This is a great update to me. This is a great idea to me. And um, personally for me, like impact wise, I would give that a nine if they're raising a number of skills up to level 20. Um, excitement level, obviously I'm not personally like that excited to play it myself, but you know, for the new guy coming up, for the free to play players, I think it's fantastic. That gets I'm a cool, nine so. and a nine for me. I think it's unreal. So uh, anyway, I, I love to see them doing that. And you know, it, it goes to show as well that even though they're not going out and saying, oh, this is what we care about, this is what we're mindful about, it shows that they're mindful of the new player experience and they're making changes to sort of support that. So anyway, that's one that I really like. Oh, and I wanted you all to meet the skill pet. Okay, Runefest, I would like you to meet, I would like you to meet Archie. It's a child mummy, which is odd to say, but he can be, he can be rude and impatient. Of course, he will act as an override for your familiars, which is when you really get to see him at his best. Go on, Archie. There we go, looking cool. Now, for many of you, this will be the ultimate prize. Or perhaps you'll be shooting for the master skill cape beyond this. Okay, first off, Archie, cool. It's a skilling pet, it's a cosmetic. I'm not gonna like, you know, put it on here and be like 10 out of 10, most impactful update of the year. That pet is super cute though, I want one. Um, skill cape, the logo looks terrible. They have said that they're gonna change the logo. So just the black and white cape, look at that. Definitely, I would not look at the logo because when I first saw it, I was like, what are they doing? Oh boy, but uh, yeah, I'm really glad they're going to be changing the logo. And uh, yeah, you may not mind it. I personally, I don't hate it. I just think it's a little, oh, cool. I don't know. Oh, cool. I don't look at that and Thank initially be like, much. that. that's definitely archaeology, you know? You know, you could be dusting off an antique with that bad boy. But uh, yeah, it's all good. Euro, thank you very much for the three months. I appreciate it. You're a beast. Keep it going. We'll keep the perks under wraps for now, mainly because we won't have <coughs> the context of whether or not they're good. Uh, but the skill icon may well change up to launch, so please do give us feedback. But there's something about that black and white that I find pretty slick. Um, okay, and I think it will look great with one of these, which is the Archaeology Elite Skilling Outfit. Now, this is coming out on launch of the skill and is entirely gained from Archaeology. Um, this will use something other than the fragment system. So entirely in from archaeology, that's them without saying it. And this is why like Reddit and stuff are like, they didn't talk about MTX at all. It's like they didn't go out and say, this is what we're doing with MTX. They're absolutely correct. They didn't. But that's effectively what Maud Osborne is saying there. It's going to be gained entirely through training the skill. That's, he's literally saying right there, this will not be part of Treasure Hunter. So anyway, that's one of the things that I was just like, oh boy. This is, it's one of those things. And by the way, speaking of the MTX thing, I kind of get why there was no official statement at RuneFest. RuneFest is supposed to be a celebration of what's, what's good in the game, what's exciting in the game. And here's the thing. If you give Reddit keyboard warriors or, you know, those type of people, the people who are super just, 
you know, they'll bash anything that they think is bad and they won't even comment on anything good because it doesn't push the narrative that they want to push. Here's the thing. If you give them a statement on MTX, words and not actions, they're just going to say, this statement doesn't mean anything to me anyway. So anyway, I get why there wasn't a statement, even though, you know, there could have been one, whatever. I get why there wasn't one, but you'll see in a lot of these updates in this keynote, they are, without saying it in as many words, they are commenting on MTX without directly commenting on it. So it's one of those things. I'm definitely, you know, I'm good with that. It's a Skilio fit. It's not obtained through Treasure Hunter. That's effectively what he's saying. Uh, for you to, um, that you may be used to, so you'll have to do some very specific things to gain it. I won't tell you now, but do get the uh, archaeology team drunk later to find out. Okay, now for the doozy, the release date. Okay, so outfit, I don't know. That's not, you know, the most fired up. I would say I'm excited because it's not available through Treasure Hunter, so I give it a 7. Impact, I mean, there's no good way to know, so for right now, I'm, I'm going to give it a 7, all right? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll keep it there, and let's keep it going. Okay. You can see the development is hugely progressed. You'll have played the demo in the volcano, at least if you're here and not watching on the stream. You'll be playing archaeology and all five of its dig sites, ancient invention, ancient summoning, relics, and more in January 2020. There were old school people sitting behind me, and every time they talked about anything for RS3, they would just like quietly like laughing to themselves. They were like, you know, like, when you, I'm trying to think of a good example of, of what it looked like, but it was like, you know, when you're like, you're trying really, really hard to look cool. We're like, you know, like I'm good friends with Cash and Sahel and them. So like, we all know that we're all idiots. So we're happy to act like idiots and just be ourselves. These guys were like, so stuck up just trying to like look cool to each other that they kept on just like, be like <laughs> RS3 the whole, like every two minutes, but they sat through the whole thing. And anyway, I loved it. Most people weren't like that, but there were just a couple people right behind me. And it was absolutely hilarious. They just couldn't help it. And uh, anyway, it, it was just really funny. Anyway, continue. Bang. Hello. Okay. Can I just say, Mod Raven is a beauty. He is a world-class beauty. And if you don't like this presentation, I don't know what to tell you because he's an absolute beauty. Oh, my delicious sweet potatoes. <laughs> Granny here and here to tell you about a marvelous new development of 2D that's come my way. See, the boffins over the museum have discovered this enormous bloody great island filled with lots and lots of fertile land that needs a granny's touch. <laughs> That's right, my dears. It's time for the Pottington brand to expand into new real estate, which means, my dears, you and I are going to build a farm on this great big island. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> We've got this lovely little island just off the coast of Anacronia. You've probably seen it. It's a beautiful spot for us to build some paddocks on it. So between us, by which I mean mostly you, bad back, you know, we are going to add five entirely new pens, two large, one medium, one small, and one carefully reinforced breeding pen. But we're not just raising sheep and cows anymore. Oh, no, dears, no. We're going to expand cool, so. our agricultural ambitions, and we're going to focus Thank you, our Dabadu. attention Love you, man. on Appreciate raising it. great big reptiles <laughs> with 14 entirely new species to raise on the farm. We've got frogs! These poisonous blighters should be quite useful. And we've got salamanders, because who doesn't love a lizard that can spit fire? And we've got jadinkos, because Papa Mambo's been giving me some tips. And we've got apoterosaurs. Fortunately, these ones are quite dumb, and they've not realized they can just fly away. <laughs> Don't tell them. We've got these absolute units. Look at the muscles on them. And we've got enormous bloody great death dinosaurs. You'll be able to raise each of these in the new pens on Dinosaur Island. Only those pens, mind, they shouldn't be left around the sheep. 
You can raise them, feed them, breed them, harvest them, all the features of the farm, but now with scales! They'll have some truly unique harvestable resources from these beauties. But wait, there's more! I obviously can't be in two places at once, so I've sent over someone to help you out. My own great granny or prehistoric Potterington will be there to help you out. And she'll be joined by these adorable baby dinosaurs that are so cute, you'll barely remember that they'll happily disembowel you and eat your flesh. <laughs> oh, how sweet. This is interesting because they've talked about unique rewards. I'm wondering if growing the highest tier ones, I'm wondering if you'll be able to get terrace from all pieces. And I wouldn't be I wouldn't be shocked. They would have to be like a one in thousands and thousands and thousands, but it could be very, very interesting. I I it's a thought that I I had, and I definitely I wouldn't be shocked if it happens. Because the weapons already come into the game through skilling. So anyway, it'll be interesting to see. If they do it, I'm sure they'd make it so Hunter is still by far the best way to do it. But I wouldn't mind if, you know how they did a one in a million for a Hex Hunter bow from a, uh, from a Nihil? Or sorry, from a, a, a Zarite bow from a Nihil? I would love it if they did like a one in, let's say like 50,000 for growing a dinosaur to get a Terra Mall piece. Because it would just be that, that thing that like, it would never ever happen. It would happen to a couple people a year, but it would just be really, really cool. So anyway, I, appreciate you. I would like to see it. I think it would be pretty cool. Dino Bait would be another really good one as well. But uh, anyway, I also wanted to say, just Odd Raven, he's so fantastic at presenting these things. I know someone's gonna be like, oh, it's so cringy, whatever. But like, he is so like in character and he's so just like in it and he's so like with it. And it just, it it's really impressive to see. Cause like I presented things before. I I strive to be as like in the moment as, as Mod Raven is there. He honestly just does a fantastic job. <laughs> it's cringe when someone's excited about something. I know, right? Everyone's like, oh my God, it, it's so cringy that he's excited about the game that he's been working on for the last 10 years. I hate it when that happens. Alrighty, in we go. You'll need to build this farm yourself using the resources you've already been gathering on the island. And you'll have to find the animals by hunting down the great big lizards, catching them in traps, and generally mass murdering their parents. You know, the usual. All your boosts, such as multiple traits and improved shiny chances, will carry over from the existing farm. It's going to be quite the opportunity, dears. Why? With this new farm and all these lovely ingredients, you could make some very special stuff. I mean, the possibilities. Whatever will you be able to do with all of these things? Oh, for God's sake. What is it with you and this bloody LARPing? <laughs> Mod Raven, everybody. Okay, that's Mod Orion, by the way. He's an absolute beaut. He's a super, super nice guy. Uh, Player on Farms 2, update impact. I mean, I kind of got to give it a 9 because they're, you know, it comes with the 120 farming announcement that's coming right here. Um, excitement level, I don't love Player on Farms, so I'm going to give it a 7 because I just, I, I, don't, I don't love the POF update. But personally, like, I totally get it if you guys are like an 8 or a 9 or a 10. Like, I totally, totally get it because it's exciting. It's cool. It's just, it's personally just for me, not my exact cup of tea. But uh, yeah, I'd love to hear what you guys think about it. And let's keep it going. Hi. So a little while ago, we mentioned that we would be expanding to existing skills to level 120. <laughs> well, now that Mod Raven, uh, technically Granny Potterington, um, has introduced the Ranch Out of Time, we can probably assume that one of those skills is farming. However, we're also happy to reveal that alongside appropriately powerful rewards, we'll be raising the Herb Law skill to 120 as well. <laughs> I'm already 120 Irby. Get in. Not a problem at all. Excitement level 10. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Let's keep it going. But. Don't worry, we'll talk about that in a little while because farming is definitely not done. So, first of all, we'll be converting Mana Farm into the official farming guild. 
that will be released alongside. I love this, by the way. I just wanted to say, Old School got a farming guild and it was highly successful. A lot of the time, Old School takes updates from RS3 where like we we got Prif and then, you know, they did the same thing with the eight districts and they ended up with something really similar that was quite successful. And I actually love to see it going the other way too. I think they're very different games, but it's fantastic to see, hey, this worked out really well in the Old School environment. Let's try and do something similar in RS3. So anyway, I love that. Um, farming Guild. I'm just going to put that up there. Um... Okay, we're just gonna call it farming g because spacing is a problem but uh yeah that's what i'm really excited about it looks really nice as well so anyway i'm very good with that reputation and rewards and stuff as you can probably imagine and we'll be adding an entirely new training method in which you can help out noob farmers with their own small startup farms by giving them all of the supplies that they need they will come and visit you at the farming guild and ask all of you master farmers for your help so new training method, I'm always good with that. I think so long as like as, as much as you can diversify a skill, it's great. So I'm always happy with those things. Obviously, it won't impact me. I'm like level 107 or 108 farming. So it's more something for like a lower level player, I would guess. But, you know, as long as it's fun to do, I think it's always good. And, you know, the more alternatives you can give to train a skill, the more likely it is that you're going to make somebody happy. So I'm good with that. And because it's the farming hub, you're going to be able to build a new invention machine that lets you view all of your patches from the guild um, without having to use the remote farming spell each time. Uh, for something a little weird, uh, a little strange, but still extremely helpful. So farming guild, update impact. I mean, I'm going to give it a six excitement level. I'm going to give it a, a seven just because, you know, it, it, it's going to be nice. It's going to be cool. I'm glad that we're getting one. But I don't think it's like, it's not game changing in that sense. It's just, it's going to be convenient. And sort of along the lines of the same convenient stuff, we've got the remote farming machine, which I also think is fantastic. It's the first time we're seeing what looks like an invention machine in a non-invention guild location. I'm excited about it. I think it's really good that they're sort of expanding that idea. And it all kind of fits into the quality of life thing of making things a little quicker, a little easier, so that, you know, the players can spend more time doing the things they enjoy. It's almost like a bit of a daily scape reduction here. Um, having this available and, you know, just making farming easier to train, faster to train. So anyway, I like it a lot. Um, perfect. Perfect. I love spacing. Um, we'll just call it the remote. Uh, update impact. It's it's the same thing where, like, it's not the most impactful thing, but it's helpful. I'll give it a six. I'll give it a six. Keep it going. We're going to be adding an unlockable Bloodwood Benny, tree thank you for the Twitch Prime sub. Well. I appreciate um, it. This will be it's at the kind guild and a much safer, convenient place um, than the other Bloodwood tree patches. Uh, also, as a bonus, um, we've also added a fourth unlockable spirit tree patch as well, just to enhance that teleport na network. OK, we think it's time for some new crops. Uh, something to grow other than dragons and dinosaurs. Um, so we've added dragon fruit. Um, <laughs> with technically, these are a type of cactus, by the way. So we've also added a, an additional a third uh, craftable, constructable cactus patch on the island of Anachronia in which you can grow them in. Uh, that's not all. In fact, we've added a whole manner of new produce to grow. For example, these high-level mushrooms. We're adding carambola. Chiku and Garanya fruit trees. We're adding mangoes, avocados, and lychee fruit bushes as well. Uh, and if that wasn't enough, you'll be able to plant a money tree in the farming guild. Uh, that's if you're lucky enough to find the seeds, by the way. Um, all right, obviously, we're adding a new emote and two impactful master farming perks. These help you with growing crops and help you raise the animals and dinosaurs on your farm. Ah, all of this means that we're adding a ton of farming produce, uh, as well as having recently added the Arbuck herb with the Anachronia update. So let's talk herb lore. So as for the new crops, they're introducing, what, like 12 to 15, probably even more than that, new herbs. I wasn't counting them all out, but uh, new crops, new herbs. I think it's um, I think it's good. Obviously, that's going to make a very big difference in terms of you know how we play the game, and we don't know what the effects of these new things are, but based on you know everything else they've done and how impactful most of the other things they've announced and released are going to be, or, or sort of look like they're going to be, I would say it's safe to assume this is going to be quite impactful in terms of like how the game actually you know plays. There's no way they're going to be releasing these things to do nothing. 
Um, I, I would be very surprised if they did that. Just based on how the rest of the day has gone, I think there's a lot of a sense of like they want to make sure things are making a big difference and they change the way you play the game. So for me, I am going to put an eight there with a star, which is I'm going to assume it's going to be in and around an eight in terms of how much it impacts the game. Um, even though we don't know what the actual effects are, there just there are so many different things there, and there's a lot to unpack. I think it's all you know. There, there's a good chance some of it or most of it is going to be useful. Um, excitement level. I'm always happy for new herbs. I'm always happy for new content. I'm always happy for that stuff. So I'm gonna give it an eight. Let's keep it going. All of the stuff that you'll be farming will be used to make this new base ingredient called primal extract. This opens the door to some of Gilanor's pretty powerful and potent potion recipes. Let's take a quick look at them. Obviously, we've added a new tier of weapon poison. I love this. I, I, I think they should give it a new name. It's just like, <laughs> weapon poison, you know, in 2025, it'll be weapon poison plus, 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 to the power of seven, which is, you know, always fun. But, you know, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm interested. <laughs> we've combined prayer and summoning pots so i'm gonna give this a six and a six like a uh, weapon poison it, it isn't the most interesting thing to me because all it is is you drink it it gives you extra dpm for doing nothing so i don't think it's really game changing but you know it's interesting and i would love to see them do something with this where it's maybe untradeable maybe i don't know what you guys think about that but uh, I would also see, I'd love to see it be a little easier to make than the current Weapon Poison Plus Plus, where you need the coconut milk and you need to get the, uh, the nightshade as well from the cave. I would love to see them doing something, you know, untradeable, exciting um, with all of it. So anyway, that's uh, sort of my thought there. Into one. There we go. And uh, this next one. So the prayer summoning one. Um, I've heard a lot of people talking about this one. Um, so it's going to give you summoning spec points. It's not a super restore because a super restore gives you summoning, summoning of familiar points. This will be special attack points. Um, this to me, and I had a conversation with Omid about this because it was a bit of a head scratcher initially because the way that you currently use summoning potions in the game is you spam them, right? You go through them as quickly as you possibly can. So our question was, how is this going to work? You're just going to be on full prayer points, infinitely going through it. But the, uh, the realization we came to is if you make this with a four-dose summoning cool, so. potion, a four-dose prayer potion, and a crystal flask, effectively what it's going to be doing is it's going to be turning four doses of prayer potion into two free doses of summoning potion. So effectively what you're doing is you're decreasing the cost of summoning flasks um, through this update. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's why they're introducing it as an interesting, you know, decent way to reduce the cost of, of going through those summoning flasks. So anyway, that's one that I'm happy with. That's one that I'm good with because already a crystal flask is 1K, a potion flask is 6K. So you're taking 5K off the price right there. And then on top of that, you're turning four doses of prayer potion, which is what, like 4K into two doses of summoning flask, which is another, what, like 10K right there. So already you're taking 15, 16K off the price. So that's why I think that's actually a really good useful impactful update that uh it kind of falls into the same line of making I'm pvm cool, so. cheaper to do so i'm always happy with it i'm actually going to give that an impact level of seven it doesn't change the entire game but excitement level i give that a nine not even for like the update itself but like what it means for you know them being aware of these types of things in terms of making pvm cheaper to do i'm always going to be happy with an update like that so that's sort of what i think about that um moving on to the next one uh, the thing, thank you for the sub, and Leah Vanny as well, thank you for the three months. Play a suggestion uh, after we reached out on Twitter a little while ago. Um, it's called the Charming Potion. While active, you can gather summoning charms at double the rate that you normally would through both combat and skilling. Ah, okay, next. So, Charming Potion, this one's interesting. Um, basically, it's going to double the rate that you gain charms. I, I'm not sure about this one. I don't know why they felt the need to do it kind of a little bit. It's going to double the rate of charms. Here's the thing. I don't care. Like, I don't think it's, oh, it's OP, like ban the thing. I just, I don't, they're not raising, they're not raising summoning to 120 anyway. The odds of this potion being below like level 110 or below to make pretty low. So I don't see this being particularly useful unless you're a skiller who just wants to go for 120 or 200 mil cosmetically. I don't see it being huge, but uh, 
yeah, if they do it eventually, then it makes a little bit of sense. So that's one that I'm more like into for for later on. Impact wise, I think it's impactful in terms of it doubles the rate of charms, but depending on the level of using it, I think, you know, it could be difficult to actually, you know, affect the majority of the player base. Excitement level, I'm gonna give that a four. I don't, I don't really think it needed to happen, but that's just me. It's all interesting. Let's introduce you to the Potion of Harvest. This is a weird one, this. While under the effects of this potion, your regular allotment produce will mutate into mega awesome crops. We're talking golden watermelons, rainbow sweet corn, and uh, cannonball cabbages. These mega crops, alongside all of the meat from Big Game Hunter, that you probably have quite a lot of now, um, can be used as ingredients to make the new ultimate best-in-slot food, the Primal Feast. This can be unpacked into multiple portions in your inventory whenever you wish, which means that its healing potential per inventory slot is absolutely huge. Right, uh, now that we've come... Okay, the Primal Feast is very interesting. So you're putting it in your invent, you're chopping it up in your invent, and then you're eating multiple portions. Um, it's, it's interesting. It's a new mechanic we haven't seen with food in a long time, unless you're factoring in like a basket of cabbages, for example, or a basket of strawberries that are definitely like a lot more relevant in something like old school because they heal a percentage of your life points and they stack up. But they've said right here, he just said it right there, it's going to be better than, better than a brew in terms of HP per invent spot. And my guess is going to be that it comes out um, effectively. What you're going to do is you're going to get a bunch of portions that heal, let's say, 2,000 per. And, you know, maybe you get five portions per. So you're getting 10,000 life points per invent slot, which would be slightly better than a super brew, for example. But you would still likely lose adrenaline for consuming it. So it's interesting. I don't know if at, you know, what I just said as a random guess, it, it, I don't think it's going to be that relevant in terms of endgame PVMing because the lossless food is always going to be better unless you absolutely need the healing. But it's definitely interesting. It's always good to have more options for HP per invent slot. Um, yeah, it's exciting. And if they come out with this with no trade-off, like let's say this, you can eat it without losing adrenaline, instantly this will be the new best food in the game um, by far because obviously even if you're overloading, a brew will still lower your stats. So yeah, it's just interesting, and it's going to be very nice. Yeah, exactly what you said, Paul, there with, uh, you know, making the jump from, you know, yakking a boss to taking a Nihil or a Titan. It's going to be really, really decent for that. So anyway, I'm excited for it. We'll see how it actually works, obviously, what the balancing is. But my guess right now, and, you know, you guys can quote me on this or make fun of me if I'm super wrong. My guess would be between 10 and 11,000 HP heal per invent slot, which is... Yeah, that's very, very hefty right there. And, you know, they've said, you know, you can get these like super powered crops, like the golden or sorry, the cannonball cabbages and golden watermelon. I would love to see these be um, either untradeable or, you know, partially untradeable, where there's some component of it that you have to get yourself through farming and then some component otherwise, just because it's kind of like herb lore and overloads, which I really think is a fantastic mechanic. It's kind of like what a lot of people wish they had done with the criminal bolts where it actually gives fletching a use if you make them, you know, untradeable or partially untradeable. So anyway, we'll see what they do with it, but I'm excited. I think it's going to be good. Covered food. Um, here, actually, let me just go into here. Update impact. We don't know if it's going to be lossless or not, right? And that's a tough thing. The impact would be a 10 if it's lossless to eat, but because we don't know, and my guess based on what it looks like is it's not going to be lossless. You're still going to lose a drain for eating it. I'm going to give you a seven excitement level. I'm going to give it a seven as well because I'm always relatively excited to see just new options for, for eating food. And, you know, I would have given Blubbers the same thing in terms of that, where they would have been an eight or a nine impact and a seven in excitement because, you know, I'm not throwing a party because they announced a new type of food, but it's always good to see. How about prayer? Well, obviously, we're going to be making extreme prayer potions. Duh. However, there's also this little thing, the blessed flask. This flask is quite time-consuming to make, think masterwork, but once you have one, you'll be able to charge it with tons of extreme prayer potions. Bring it with you, and you'll have prayer points for days. Okay, a quick curveball now. This. Okay. He went over this very quickly. I love this thing. I absolutely love this thing. It is an infinite prayer flask. It'll take a long time to make, 10 hours, 15 hours, whatever it is. I love this thing. And, and here's why. First off, 
when you're talking about people nihiling bosses and getting into nihiling tightening bosses, one of the things that's problematic is like if you're bringing three prayer potions or four prayer potions, all of a sudden, you know, like, oh, look at my Telos invent. I think I have space for eight or nine food, which I know how to do now. But when I was first making the jump, it was very difficult to do. What this is going to do is it's going to save everybody a couple invent spaces when PVMing. It's going to be really, really nice for that in terms of not having as harsh of a trade off between food and not having food. Things I like about this that uh, he brushed over very quickly as well. You're going to have to load it up with prayer potions of your own. So it's still going to cost prayer pots. It's not like um, the ancient elven ritual shard, but permanent. You can click it as often as you want. But you should be able to load this bad boy up with, you know, a thousand prayer potions. Bring it in one invent spot. It's a quality of life thing that I think is really, really nice. I think it's uh, it's really good. It's not too overpowered for like the end game player, but I think it's going to help a lot of people out. So it's one that I really, really like. I think it's fantastic. I think making it untradeable and time consuming to make is a perfect reward space for something like this. So anyway, that's why I instantly gave it a 10 and a 10. Um, it's it's something where, I'm, once again, it's, it's a 10. I'm not throwing a party because of this thing, but I really like the thinking behind it. And I think it's the type of thing that is nice to see. And, and thus far through all these updates we've been through, a lot of them are very meaningful. And I like that a lot too. A lot of them will change the metas. A lot of them will change the way you play the game. And I think that's something that's been missing for the last three, four, five years um, in terms of most updates being sort of niche or you know not that good. Every single thing on this list we've gone through today pretty much is very useful, is going to be interesting, is going to be fun to play with. So anyway, I like it. I'm excited for it. Um, yeah, let's keep it going. Bring it with you and you'll have prayer points for days. Okay, a quick curveball now. This is an adrenaline crystal. This isn't new. Right, it's not. Um, but we'll be adding drops to PVM and Slayer drop tables, which you can convert into adrenaline crystals if you have a high enough herb lore level. Uh okay, so he also brushed over this one. This needed to happen. I am so happy it's happening. Someone in the comments go, oh my God, Ryan, it should have happened on release 10 months ago. The best time to make this update was 10 months ago. That was the best time to do it. You know what the second best time to do this is? It's right now, it's today. They've realized it's a problem. I'm excited for it. I've spent over 100 mil on adrenaline crystals in the last year. Like, it's it's insane that they're so expensive. They're like, what, 260K each for an extra 5% adren? And making them like even 10 times more common, 20 times more common. One, it gives people training Slayer more GP per hour, which is fantastic. Two, it reduces the cost of PVM. Check both the boxes, bang, bang, easy as that. It's fantastic. And one of the people who was, you know, in charge of this update is Mod Iago. I love that guy. Thank you. You're an absolute beaut. Um, this is another one that, I mean, impactful. Does it change the entire game? No, but it's a huge quality of life. I would actually give that a nine and excitement wise, I'm also right up there with a nine. I think this is great. I'm so glad that they're mindful of it and they're doing it. I'm very happy. It's a big play. Uh, into adrenaline crystals if you have a high enough herb lore level. Also, herb level to do it. Adrenaline crystals are still going to be tradable, I would guess. So I think, you know, you'll be able to do it, but you'll also be able to buy them yourself as far as I know, which... I think is good. I think it's it's nice that they're not being converted to something untradeable. Even though they could have, I think, you know, it's fine that they're viable. They're not that much better than a regular A-pod. And I know also someone in the comments is going to go, oh my God, Ryan, why do you care about 5% Adren? Why does it even matter? Does it even make a difference? Um, there are a couple points where an Adren crystal is really useful. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, P3 Telos. Uh, if you're 100% Adren, it means you can do two thresholds in the red beam, a pot, and you go all the way up to 100, and then you go to onslaught. So there are a couple of niche spots where the Adren crystal is really good, and it's something to base rotations off of. So them being cheaper, it's great. Less of a trade-off to make. To PVM and Slayer drop tables, which you can convert into adrenaline crystals if you have a high enough herb lore level. Uh, I can tell a few of you will be happy about that. Um, okay, so far, I hope Hit this me. hasn't been Get information in. overload. <gasps> Introducing the Elder Overload. This boosts your combat stats by 17% plus 5. So 17% plus 5, that's going to take your stats to 115 plus 5. You're going to go up to 120. So it's going to be a regular Overload is 116, a Supreme is 118, and Elder is 120. These are going to be made by taking an existing Supreme Overload salve and then adding something to it. They haven't talked about what that is, but it's going to be another 2 plus stat boost on the Supreme Overload. We like it. 
as you probably expected. So that's gonna be the salve. There will be a standard one as well, obviously, that will be made differently. But if you've made a bunch of salves, don't worry, because you'll be also be able to convert into like an Elder Overload salve that'll have everything in it. Uh, stats do not round up. No, it's gonna be 120 as far as I know. Should be exactly 120. And finally, we have two entirely new genres of potion. Okay, so right off the top, Elder Overload. Um, oh boy, I mean, impact. You're going from 118 to 120 stats. It's not like that's the most impactful thing, but, you know, it's cool to see. I'm always excited about it. I'm going to give you a good 8 excitement level. I'll say an 8. It's, it's interesting. It's fun. They're going to look cool. I'm good with it. Bursts. They can double your health pool. They can... Okay. Double health pool. Um... That's kind of crazy. I'm just... I'm trying to think where that would actually be good. Because people are initially going to go, Oh my god, that's so broken. But looking at the boss in the game, where could you actually use 20,000 HP? Right? I'm thinking high enrage Telos, and I'm thinking tanking green bombs, and I'm thinking onslaughts. KK green as well. Those are the ones that I can think of. Um, other than that, I don't, I don't see it being like that useful. KBD on your hardcore cash. I ought to ban you, sir. Um, ice prison. I mean, even then, you're not going to die to an ice prison. So anyway, it's interesting. It's all really interesting. I don't think it's going to be that broken, actually, for a short amount of time. Um, it's going to be niche, and I think that's fine. For stun pool? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Every time I'm doing, I'm doing Yakamaru with Cash and Zahel, got to bust out that power burst potion. But, yeah, I think it's interesting. It can make you extremely fast with unlimited surge charges. Basically, they give you crazy powerful effects for a short burst of... Unlimited surge? is another sure very so. interesting one where on paper it's like, oh my goodness, I'm sure Clue Hunters are going to love that thing. Um, I'm trying to think like, where would I actually like, you know, use that? Um, it might be good for Adren building between Rago phases. For example, if you end a phase on like 20% Adren, you're still in combat. You could actually just surge off global cooldown and continue getting Adren. That's where I think I would probably use it. But other than that, I don't see it being super game changing. It'll be good for Rots tunnels. But uh, it's all it's all interesting, and uh, I think they're going to last for, like, what, 10 to 20 seconds, something like that? I think it's all interesting. Escaping in the wildy, I would bet they don't work in the wilderness, so I wouldn't worry about that. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's really, really cool. It's interesting. Yeah, so it'd be spamming surge. Oh, did I say off global cooldown? I meant on, on global cooldown, so every 1.8 seconds, basically, you'd be able to get a gen for the surge. But yeah, anyway, it's, uh, it's going to be interesting. I'm excited for it. Crystal Lore, thank you for the 12 months. I appreciate it. ...of time... And something we're particularly excited about, craftable bomb. Okay, so power burst potions, um, I would say impact like a seven, excitement a seven. It's going to be interesting. They, they seem pretty niche though to me right now. They seem relatively niche, um, but still they could be fun to play around with. Now we've got, we've got craftable bombs, which is pretty interesting. Okay. These are an entirely new content uh, combat mechanic. Um, you'll be able to launch poison bombs, sticky bombs, and uh, vulnerability bombs. Okay, so we've got poison, we've got sticky, we've got vuln. Vuln bombs, I'm guessing, aren't going to touch affinity, although it'd be very cool if they did. That's going to be a really good way to vuln with all three combat styles, as far as I know. That's cool. Uh, sticky bombs, I'm guessing that's either a stun or a bind. Could be very good at any boss that's stunnable just to get that 188% damage rack where, you know, if they're lossless to use, you can chuck those bad boys on and you'll always be able to deal that extra damage. It could be very interesting for breaking Telos' freedom. Another thing I thought of too is on the normal spellbook right now, at Telos, one of the reasons it's not as good as Ancients is because you can use an Ice Barrage oh, auto shit. attack like in the font to break Telos' freedom and then you can stun lock the boss out of that. And what it does is it allows you to get through all of phase four without getting a single auto attack. Using one of these bombs to accomplish the same thing could mean you could see people using normal spellbook at Telos uh, just, you know, for an easier Telos kill kind of thing, a little bit less complexity with the spellbook swaps and all that stuff, and still being able to get really good effective kills. So I think it's it's useful and it could be interesting. Um, that's one, yeah, I'm pretty good with. Um, do I reckon they will stack? I, 
upon first inspection, based on what they what they do, I wouldn't be surprised if they stack. I'll be honest. I my my guess right now would be that they stack. That's what I would say. But yeah, anyway, let's go back and and rehear what he had to say about we're them. Something particularly excited about craftable bombs. Okay. These are an entirely new content uh, combat mechanic. Um, you'll be able to launch poison bombs, sticky bombs. Oh yeah, and the other one was the poison bomb, yeah. That one, I mean, it's interesting because we've already got weapon poison plus, 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 and we've got cinder banes and everything else, but yeah, we'll see what they do with that, how they make that unique. Overall, though, with the bombs, um, and, uh, they seem quite impactful. Bombs, they make the game uh, easier whichever unfortunate for victims you know, newer players. areas you choose. These area effects linger for a short while, so any unfortunate enemies that fall prey to them will be affected by the effect while they're active. That sounds like one minute. Can I just say that, that, that short while? I would bet it's, unless these things are like stackable and really easy to reapply, it's gonna be a minute. If they make them like 10 seconds and you have to click on one every 10 seconds, I just think that wouldn't be the best design. I'd be surprised if they did that, unless there was a way to like auto deploy them. Okay. Here's the master herb lore part. Okay, so craftable bombs. I'm gonna give the impact. I mean, it's gotta be at least an eight. Excitement. I'm gonna give it a nine. And and here's why. It's not because the three effects they've given are like insane. They're gonna change the whole game. But I like that they're giving us different ways to apply something like a vol. I think it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be useful. I think it's gonna be good to play around with. And yeah, that's that's why I'm really excited about it. Perk, which directly assists the production of overloads. Right. Why farming and herb lore? You might be... Okay, so let me go back here because he went Here's over this very, very quickly. This Master Herb Cape perk is exactly what a lot of people have been asking for for a long time, which is you can create overload supremes, elder overloads in batches of five using 20% fewer ingredients. So this is incredible because what it does is it's cutting down on that prep time it's going to take for getting into pvming 20 percent is significant if you can get that every single step of the way it's going to stack with everything else you already have the scroll of cleansing all that stuff so i actually i really like that and i think that's a, a valuable rewarding perk for a 120 herb player um and yeah it's the same thing where once you've done the 120 it's going to give you you know quicker faster less expensive access into pvming that's something I love to see. That's a nine. That's a nine for me. I think it's really good that they're super mindful. They did it with divine charges earlier of, you know, the cost of PDMing and how much time it takes to actually go and kill the boss you want to kill. So anyway, that's what I really like. Right. Why farming and herb lore? You might be thinking. Both skills have a significant amount of content from 1 to 99, and herb lore is in fact completely stacked at the high levels. Um, but also, farming is one of our most oh popular oh no, skills, no, no, especially no, no, with the introduction no, no, of no, no, player-owned farm yeah. last year. So thanks for the 18 months. Uh, but more importantly, it. these two skills Your enhance legend. and supplement each other as a pair, which means that it's much smoother for us to design a fulfilling experience for you. As a development team, we feel that a number of criteria really needed to be met before that we were comfortable updating those two skills to 120. So let me just reel these off. We think it's important to have valuable content and unlocks at every new level. We also Okay, unpacking that, I, I like it. I mean, it's tough to do. It's a very tall order to say every single level needs to be valuable, interesting. But effectively, what they're saying is there are going to be over 20 new unlocks between level 99 and level 120. And that's something that I like because yeah, everybody knows what it's like to level a skill. Like, um, I'm just trying to think like mining smithing before the rework right anytime you get a level most of the time nothing's even popping up that's new that you can do and you know it feels like a lot of the levels are pretty arbitrary divi is another good example with that where a lot of the levels especially like early on like you just don't unlock anything so anyway i really i like to see more of that being added so every single level you get will get you access to something cool so anyway i like that idea from a design standpoint of saying hey every single one of these levels is important every single one is meaningful I, uh, I, I really like that, just sort of as a um, as sort of like a, a design goal or, or plan that's going to kind of come along with a lot of the updates this year. So want worthwhile goals and milestones to aim for, obviously. 
We want the journey to not feel like a complete grind, which means fair XP rates and a variety of training methods and mechanics. So fair XP rates is an interesting one. To me, what that means is the higher your level is, the faster the XP is going to be, and it's going to be um, possibly even more than linear. So level 119 to level 120, they're saying, we don't want that to feel like you have to grind for 27 hours. If you're level 119, you should be getting 3 million XP an hour. And I think that's pretty cool too. I think someone's going to go on red and be like, oh my God, easy escape. My XP rate now that I'm 90 mil and the skill is so high, yada, yada, yada. I, I kind of like it. I think, you know, the game isn't what it used to be in terms of skills going to 99. And I think going above that point, I think it's cool to see those high XP rates. And something I actually don't like in the game is, uh, is getting these super high XP rates at low levels because people like to go for 120s. Like a good example is cooking where you can get like what, 1.7 mil an hour or something like that doing wines from level 35. And that seems a little crazy to me. I would much rather, you know, the skill stays nice and slow, but you know, as you get higher level, you get these higher XP rates so that if you're going for 120 right towards the end, those last levels aren't insane, but you can't blitz from level 35 to 90 in an hour. So anyway, I like that. That's a really good design thing too that I think it's good that they acknowledged. And finally, it's extremely important to add a complete chonker of a grace period for comp and trim players. Something like six or nine months. What's, what's all this smoke? So six to nine month grace period for comp trim comp. I like that too. It kind of goes along with the taking breaks from the game thing. I don't have a comp gate, but I know a lot of the people who have comp feel like, oh, I need to get my comp back. I need to get my comp back. This is the worst. And you know, you stop playing the game for fun. You start playing the game to grind out your comp cape every update. So I actually, I like the amnesty periods and I like that they're doing six to nine months because that'll give you plenty of time. Even if you've got a full-time job, everything else that you'll be able to finish off these skills without putting that much time in every day so that, you know, you won't feel like you have to, oh, I got to wake up and, and train for 27 hours today, man. I just, I have to, you know, that whole feeling of like needing to do something you don't feel like. I hate it. I think it, do it doesn't go well with any video game. So to me, big amnesty period. I am, I'm fine with it. You're saying six months is good. Nine is too much. I don't think there's an amnesty period. That's, that's too much for something like this. I think, you know, give people as, as long as you possibly can for these things. If, uh, you know, if it's a, something as big as a skill, if you do a two week amnesty period, you're basically saying, all right, guys, hope you're okay to take the next two weeks off work. If you want your comp back right away, you're getting people into like grinding the game. And I think games should be played for fun. So as a casual player, as someone who isn't playing that much, it means if I was a comp player, I would be able to get 120 farming and 120 herbivore without putting that much time in every single day. I, um, I'm happy with it. What? Oh God, okay, I need to get off the stage. Okay. The creators. Oh, this is the quests. Yeah, I'm you excited for these. As the elder gods. You may think them united, but they are not. You may think they speak with one voice, but they do not. At the dawn of this universe, there was no life save for them. But there was still conflict. That conflict will come again. Alas, we are a Oh, I gotta talk about this. Look at Mod Osborne's shirt. Someone made a Reddit post with RuneFest bingo and like all the bad things that were gonna happen. He printed it out, he put it on a shirt, and then he started crossing things off as they happened. Can I just, can we get some claps? For that? I love that. This was, this was literally the highlight of the keynote for me, was seeing Mod Osborne's freaking shirt. He's an absolute legend. I love it. I absolutely, I would pay good money for that shirt. I just, oh, it, it made me so happy to see that, you know, they're aware of this stuff. Obviously they are. And oh, I just, I know some people, it's going to like rub them the wrong way. Like, oh my God, they didn't talk about this, that, and the other. And they knew that we had a concern about it. 
it's Reddit. You can't, you can't make Reddit happy. There's no way to do it. So why not put it on a shirt, wear it, and tell everyone, we see your concerns, we get it. There's no making you happy. Let's try and win some bingo. So anyway, I just, I love it. I think it's fantastic. Approaching the end. Hopefully there's been something revealed so far that has wet your whistle a wee bit. Okay, so before they get into the timeline, Elder God Wars Dungeon. So, as far as I know, Elder God Wars Dungeon on a release will be four bosses. I'm feeling so... Kind of like God Wars 1 and God Wars 2. But there is a plan for a fifth boss. So, I'm excited. Unfortunately, it's going to be the last update of the year, but it is coming this year. It'll be summer 2020. Um, obviously, ideally for me, you don't have to wait that long for a new boss release, but I'm excited for it. Even though it's like, you know, another God Wars dungeon, and obviously the first four bosses, I'm expecting them to be relatively, you know, massable, maybe not like crazy, crazy endgame. I'm still very excited because it's PVM content that I'll get to play through. But more than anything else, I am very excited for that fifth boss whenever it shows up whatever it is i think it gives them a fantastic opportunity to put out something that you know stands the test of time like telos and virago have you know these bosses that don't have changing difficulties like the ambassador i loved the ambassador for my first 10 solos but after doing it 10 times knowing that there's n it's never going to be any different every time i run through it you get bored of it pretty easily just because it's the same i now know i can do it with no food i've done it so many oh, times before shit. i know exactly how much everything's going to hit and I would much rather a boss like Telos or Virago where, you know, your team size affects how Virago works, your enrage affects how Telos works. I hope they do something like that for this God Wars boss. I would love to see something on a whole other level from Telos. I'd love to see something that's easy when you start out at a lower enrage or a lower, you know, however they want to set it up, but gets very, very difficult. And I'm hoping this fifth boss is going to be that. And if they come out with this boss and it's a good boss fight and it's fun, I don't mind waiting a long time for it. I really just don't mind waiting. I think it's going to be fantastic. Yeah, I mean this year as in within within a calendar year of this moment, right? Summer 2020 is like 10 months from now. So that's that's kind of what I meant by that. But anyway, I'm excited for it. I think uh yeah, it should be it should be really interesting. But now let's talk timeline. Um Elder God Wars update impact. Um you guys already know. You guys already know it's gonna be a 10 out of 10 for me. Come on. That's this is why I play the game. I play the game to kill stuff, so. You know, I'm, I'm going to be loving that update no matter how they do it. Okay, in we go. But let's have a quick recap so you can have a bit of context. <coughs> yeah. Have a quick context of when things are coming out and what to expect. Previously on Runefair. Uh, Snowy, thank you for the 12 months, by the way. I really appreciate well, it. You're an absolute we have legend. Thank you so much. We skill coming in January 2020, which gives us a nice little point for all the other updates to cuddle around. So that's out okay. in a couple months. Next, we can put the mega trinity of updates that are all coming on the same day in November. Ranch out of time, farming to 120, and herb law to 120. So November. For all of these updates, it's October right now. Normally when they say November, they mean the last Monday of November. So I would pencil that in as either November 18th or November 25th. I would guess it happens on the 25th. Um, that is a trio of huge updates. It really is. I am very excited for them. And it's coming soon. These are three large updates that all feed each other. The ranch pushing farming to 120 alongside new patches, and then the ranch handing us primal extract, a resource essential for all the new potions, bombs, power bursts, and more that fill up Herb Lord to 120. In summer, summer 2020, we have the small matter of the Elder God Wars dungeon. So while it is admittedly a little far off, we're about to start development. We've already had design meetings, and we're all getting a little bit excited. So I spoke to some JMods about Elder God Wars. Yeah, summer 2020, like he said there, and he was transparent about this, right? He said, we haven't started development yet. And that's exactly where it's at right now, where they've got plans. They've got a basic idea of what they want to do with it, especially with the first four bosses. As far as I know, not a whole lot has been done with the fifth boss where like people don't know what it's going to be or how it's going to work or have any clue about anything related to it. But, you know, here's the thing. Good things are worth waiting for. In a perfect world, I would say, you know, I wish all of this was coming out tomorrow because it's all so exciting and cool. But it's it's one of those things where I'm glad it's happening. I'm excited for it. Um, and then hopefully in the period of time between now and summer 2020, I'm hoping Jagex has an opportunity oh, to shit. tackle the early game experience and getting into PVMing. And hopefully by the time Elder God Wars Dungeon comes out, 
there are a lot of brand new PBMers and people who are actually starting to play this content. And to me, that's really exciting because, you know, if they came out with it tomorrow, they've got this huge issue of most players in the game, like literally, I would say probably 80% of the player base not trying PVMing or getting super into it because it's not efficient or it's discouraging or whatever. So it gives them a lot of opportunity to work on the quality of life of learning it, to work on the tutorial system, to work on the combat system, to work on the tooltips. I'm excited, assuming they use that time wisely. I think it's going to be a good thing. Okay. Well what do I want to see on the bosses? Um, I want to see challenge modes that are difficult because the challenge modes from god wars 2 are annoying but they're not difficult they just basically gave the monsters big auto attacks and gave them a lot of hp i want to see challenge modes that are fun i want to see challenge modes that are actually difficult and then normal mode you already know they want them to be like you know massive bosses that you know will be mechanical will be a little difficult but will also be able to you know you'll, you'll be able to take them out with your friends as sort of a social pvm or which i think is fine obviously for me personally you know, if, if everything was exactly catered to me, which it isn't, because obviously I'm just a dude, I'm just a player, every boss they released would be super hard and have enraged and have tons of engaging mechanics and yada yada yada. But I, I don't think this main four bosses, like, I don't think they're they're for me. You know what I mean? And I just want them to make other people happy, the people that they're actually designed for. You know, let's say maybe the more casual PVMer, the more, um, you know, the PVMer who wants to get into things and, and learn how to play the game and who's kind of coming up on the PVM ladder. So... Anyway, I'm, I'm very excited for it, despite it not being distinctly, like, specifically for my kind of player type. Aquila B, thank you very much for the two months. I appreciate it. Let's keep it going. What next? Well, we have the storyline that will be building up towards the Elder God Wars dungeon. There'll be a number of quests next year, but you can be sure of Desperate Measures featuring Anachronia and Kerapak and a City of Sentistan quest delivering on expectations of what an of Sentistan quest would be like. You could probably guess some. Okay, let's... Okay. He kind of hopped over that, but... Wait for it. Oh, I gotta scroll down. Um, new Sentistan quest? Curses 2? Question mark? Is that what he was hinting on? Because, you know, if so, that's, that's kind of exciting. I always love to see it. Um, things like that. I think, I think it's cool. So anyway, we'll, we'll see what happens with all of that, obviously. But, uh, you know, here, actually, let's go back a little bit. Let's computer enhance and actually listen to what he said exactly. Delivering on expectations of what an of Sentistan quest would be like. You could probably guess some. Okay, let's... Yeah, you could probably guess some of, of expectations of what it would be like. So anyway, that's not a confirmed anything, but I would love to see, you know, they talked about new spells earlier. I'd love to see some new prayers as well. It's always interesting. It's always cool. That's not something where I'm like, oh, this needs to happen. But it, it's it's a cool storyline. It's an exciting storyline. And I think it is going to be a lot of fun, even though, you know, obviously we know nothing but the name of it. Um, I can't really say what impact it's going to be to me, but I'm pretty excited. Even though it's a quest, someone's going to be like, oh my God, how is Ryan excited for a quest? You're not even quest cave. SMH. I, I think it's going to be cool. And I'm excited for quests with good rewards. So, Yeah. Anyways, I'm all good with it. Greater Soul Split. Yeah, probably not. Soul Split's the most busted thing of all time right now. But uh, yeah, let's see what happens. What tier drops do I think uh, God Wars 3 will be? It's hard to say. Um, I don't, I, I hope they're not tier 88. I really don't want them to be tier 88. I want them to, you know, if they're tier 88, I hope they all have special effects that make them useful in a lot of places. I think anytime you're coming out with new content, I'd like it to be relevant. You don't want content that goes over other content. Like, for example, if you if you have a God Wars 3 boss that drops a scythe that's identical to a Nox scythe, you know, that's probably not good either. But I would love to see, yeah, items with items with meaningful effects that are useful to play, um, even outside of the tier system. I, I definitely don't want these things to be like, oh yeah, this will be your new best Vindicta killing weapon. You know what I mean? So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Tier 90 with tier 92 accuracy, 388 damage. Something like that could be really nice or... You know, you could even play around with something like this. Um, something like, let's say, tier 94 accuracy, tier 88 damage would be a really interesting one too because at that point, you'd be able to have a 100% hit chance at a boss like Telos. You wouldn't need a Nihil for it, but still, damage-wise, you're not going to be able to get the same kill speeds as someone who's using a tier 92, tier 92. So anyway, I think there are a lot of cool things they can do with it. I just hope whatever it is, it's meaningful. But uh, I would love to see them play around with very high accuracy, even on lower damage. Because that's something that'll help a lot of uh, a lot of people to get into PVMing. So anyway, that's one that I'm I'm excited for. I think it's gonna be cool.
chuck on some more. Let's leak some more. Let's announce it. DRS more. leakage? Uh -oh. We don't want Help. archaeology to be launched and for us to not update it further particularly as people approach the upper reaches of the skill. We also don't want to forget about anachronia. So expect Orthon, a dig site on our charming land out of time focused on the top end of archaeology. You can expect to reveal some lost knowledge about the, ain't, the art of ancient potion making here, which will contribute further to Herb Law 120. <laughs> We're also very aware that recently we haven't been giving you the content, giving you content at the rate that you would like. So to address this, the episodic content team are doing three things that we feel will go a long way, and we'll be take, talking about them more in the coming weeks. So I'm glad he said that. We know that you guys aren't happy with the rate of content. Because to me, in with all the MTX outrage and all that, all that crap that I'm not even going to talk about because it's just, it's all been said a million times at this point. Um, ultimately, for me personally, I think people are more outraged about MTX when... You've got an MTX update every week, and we haven't had a content update for 14. So him saying that, I think, is really good. And uh, I think it's it's good to know that Jagex and the player base, in this instance, are on the same page in terms of, hey, we realize that you guys aren't happy with this. Here's what we're doing about it. And I think, yeah, anyway, that's that's really, really good. And I'm uh, I'm, I'm happy that he's, he's taken the time to mention that. I think it's really important that he took the time to mention that as well. First... We're going to be expanding the team temporarily to take on a couple of updates that will allow us to get ahead of ourselves and add, conti add contingency if other updates change. So among so they're saying they're expanding the team. They're bringing in more people to work on episodic content. Cool. Other updates. This team will be working on a new pets project. Osborne's words <laughs> have proven empty again and again. Why would I believe in this time? You can believe whatever you want to believe, at the, ultimately, right? And, and you're the exact reason why they didn't make an MTX statement. If they had made a, a statement about MTX, you would have just said, well, they're just words anyway. So obviously, it's something where they need to prove themselves. They need to actually do it. And, you know, it'll be exciting to see how they do it. But, you know, when they're giving Thank you me. words in these statements, really I think, sure, you're welcome Thank to take it with a grain of salt. You're welcome to not trust them. That's totally fair enough. That's, that's up to you. But for me, the fact that they're talking about it is... It's never going to be a bad thing to communicate better. And, uh, and that's where I'm at with these things. That's, uh, that's what I would say anyway. You know, they can't come out with a year of updates in one day and then everyone's like, oh, we're all happy now. We saw the updates, you know. They've got to do this thing. They're giving us so much more than last year in terms of they're giving us all of the updates. They're giving us the timeline they want to be running off with all of this. And they're even talking about like the actual you know content team and how big the team is going to be and what they're doing to make sure there are more updates coming out. So I think it's all a positive direction, right? It's tough to be like, well, this entire, all these reveals are just words, so it's all meaningless. Like, sure, if you want to think that way, you're absolutely welcome to. Personally, for me, it's enough for me to get excited about. And, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about it that way. In the same vein as combat and skimming pets, we'll be finishing the set with pets of ports, farm, minigames, clue scrolls, and more. And like we did, thank with you all, Rosie, pets, for the two months. We I appreciate you it. Involved. So I had a great time. Competition to design the look of these pets in the next month. Go on, Presley, you can do it. Uh, the second thing we are doing to address the number of updates is to create and protect two sub teams. We have one sub team dedicated to making quests regularly. Guys. I don't like quests, but I know. I spoke to some people who do like quests, Galaxy Shark, for example. He was so fired up. They're, they're now going to have a regular quest team. Instead of taking the content dev team and saying, all right, this month you guys need to work on a quest, they're going to have, it could be a smaller team, but they're going to have a dedicated quest team. I think that's fantastic. Even though it's not for me, I can still get behind it. I think a lot of people enjoy quests. I think RuneScape lore is one of the best things in the game, even though it's something I don't totally subscribe to. I'm good with it. I think it's a good thing. And another sub team. <laughs> and we have another sub team dedicated to working on remasters to content that you love, reworking existing stuff that is in the game. The teams will begin to spin up in the coming. So that one I'm a little less like fired up about, but you know, it is what it is, and it's being communicated. So that's sort of what I'll say about that. He used the uh, the rework word, the remaster word, but uh, yeah, we'll just we'll have to see what happens in the coming months with these actual reworks and what they choose to rework and remaster and what they choose to you know actually do with this. But it's interesting. In months, but we can state that the quest team will be working on an Azanadra quest after desperate measures. 
And the Remaster 3 sub-team will be kicking off with a remaster of Managing Miscellanea, making it worth doing, adding further ways to improve your kingdom, and more. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, we were King Miscellanea. Once again, that's not going to be like a 10 out of 10. This update is huge. It's going to change my life. It's going to do my taxes, you know? But it's it's decent to look into these things. I, I'm i not even going to put it on the board, but, you know, I'd give it like a, a 5 and a 5 or a 6 and a 6. It's not going to be game-changing, but, you know, I'd love to see it as another way to make Divine Charges easier to get, for example. You know, put it on Divine Energy, and, uh, you know, I, I definitely think it could be interesting. And thirdly, we have a game jam kicking off on the 9th of October where we're all aiming to make stuff you want. Over okay, this is big and he brushed over it. Game jam is effectively tap. If you guys don't know what that is, that was when the J mods had time every single week. Like it was like, you know, half the day on Friday afternoon or whatever it was to work on whatever they were passionate about. And TAP resulted in some of the best updates the game has ever seen for quality of life, for everything, because you had creators and devs working on things that they genuinely cared about and wanted to do. You saw a bunch of the big PVM updates. You saw a lot of it. And effectively, what they're bringing back is Game Jam. That's going to be, I would guess, a week or two weeks where the J mods are going to be told, all right, guys, we've got the RuneFest figured out. We've got the new skill figured out. You guys now have two weeks. I want to see what you guys want to create for this game. And uh, that's something I love. I love to see that. I think you'll get the best work out of your devs, getting them to work on things that they're passionate about and they care about. So anyway, that's something I love to see. And, you know, that's why people are, are, are clapping and excited about it. That's one that I was really excited about as well, just because in the last year and a half or two years, you know, they removed tap where these JMods didn't have a chance to work on the things that they, they necessarily wanted to or specifically wanted to. Now you're saying, all right, you're a combat dev. Let's, uh, you know, let's make some changes. Let's get re-intercept working. Let's get uh, heal other working correctly. Let's get, uh, you know, any, anything else working that, you know, maybe is a little difficult to do or isn't working exactly correctly. I love to see it. I absolutely love it. Over a two week period. Okay. Um, we're approaching the end, but before we go, there is the small matter of RuneScape Mobile. If you were part uh, of the members beta, the you'll word. know that we launched a fantastic uh, new build help. for mobile last month. And if you weren't part of the members beta, we'd like to announce that later this year, any member with an Android phone will be able to play it without restriction. That's right, we can announce RuneScape Mobile early access for everyone will be coming very soon. And those of you on iOS can expect to play it later next year. So iOS gets it later this year. That's uh, that's useful, and then everybody on an Android gets it. That's all. That's all good for me. Um, I think you know it's cool. I'm not super into the mobile thing. I've had it for a while. I've had access. I think it's interesting. Um, right now, it still feels like something that a RuneScape player is going to use, um, you know, to sort of supplement their their online gameplay. And if that's what it's being designed for, I think they're doing an okay job. But in terms of like actually having mobile only players cross platform that way, I think it still uh, misses the mark a little bit. But you know, we'll see what happens. And you know, I'm glad they're giving everybody access to it. That's something I'm excited for. This is the important stuff. This is an effect where the tree canopies are faded out if they block the view. Of I your love this. Character. I freaking love this. We think this makes running around. <laughs> we think this makes running around forests more convenient and. Uh, <laughs> um, means you don't have to manipulate the camera as you're moving around as much. Next, let's look at a variation on this theme, which is as your character view is blocked by scenery, you can see the silhouette, so you always know where you are, even in a really densely populated area. It also means you can turn roofs back on. <laughs> this tech in the next video also shows that we're experimenting with different... So I love that last update, being able to see through things. That's one of the things that made playing on mobile kind of annoying, is your character would get lost. It's the same on PC as well, especially if you've got a smaller display. You get lost, like on the, in the Lost Grove, right? You get lost in all the trees. You can't even see your own character unless you zoom way in. I, um, I think that's a, that's a fantastic 10 out of 10. And it's worth noting, all of these are works in progress, so I have no idea when we're going to see them or even if we're going to see them. Um, but that's why some of them look a little janky at times, but it's very interesting. Types of character highlights. So what we're trying here is, as you put your mouse over different objects or characters, they kind of indicate what your, your click will do. So if it's green, it's friendly, like talking to an NPC. Then obviously red is dangerous, combat for monsters. 
and blue, more utility things like picking up objects. So I actually, and I know some people aren't gonna, you know, be the happiest with you for this. I don't actually love this one. I don't, I don't think it looks particularly good, but that's just my take on it. And it's obviously, it's gonna be something toggleable, right? The more different menus they give people, the better. So, you know, it's something I probably won't personally use, but it's, uh, it's all good. And uh, yeah, I'm sure it'll be toggleable. Um, people are saying it's gonna be good for mobile. Here's the thing. You, you don't hover your mouse over anything on mobile. So I don't even know how, how it would work on mobile, to be honest. But uh, yeah, it'll help people who are a little visually impaired as well. I think, you know, the, the more options you give to people for these types of things, the, the happier you're gonna make your player base. So it's not one I could personally see myself using, but like I said before, even if it's not for me, that doesn't mean it doesn't make things better. More utility things like picking up objects. We think this will help new players as they're learning the game, but when we've been trying it, we've also found that it's great if you play with a really zoomed out camera, uh, or also if you're playing with a small screen. One thing for PVMing, it might be nice to like not misclick on like, I don't know, like because some, some click boxes are really weird and assuming it goes over things click boxes, it'll be nice to be like, oh, I'm not clicking on Telos right now, I'm clicking on a minion. So, you know, it could be useful for that. Next, we've also been looking at ways to improve the feel of the game, especially your movement around the game world. This is a prototype with improved pathfinding. It has the player's movement being smoothed out. It's quite subtle, so in the next video, we're gonna look closer. This, to me, was the biggest one of, of all these this updates. This is the game as it is now, Check this out. before these changes. You can see the player character moving around corners. The motion can be a bit jagged, the turns a bit sharp. It's what we've all got used to. So if we have the version with smoothing on, Check this out. You'll be able to see the turning Look at is that. more gentle, more fluid. It looks more natural. It makes the game feel just that little bit more immersive. Now, for the final two... So, this feels like an actual game. It almost feels like they're removing the tile system. A little bit. They're not. They're keeping tiles, but they're changing how your player can move through those tiles. You know, when you're at AOD and you're running to the middle, and your character's like, hey, this would be the right time to enact a jigsaw puzzle with my body, and goes like that the whole time, and then you end up getting insta-killed? That would be the end of that. And I just think, like, smoother movement, it's just, it looks so good. It looks so ridiculously good. I'm so excited for it. Uh, Big Blue Lacko, thank you very much for the five months. I appreciate it. You're an absolute legend. Keep it going. Ooh tech prototypes. I need These are the prototypes that we may not see, but they are very exciting. To put a warning up first. These are going to be very early experimental prototypes. Unlike the great content we saw earlier in the keynote, for these, not only do we not have release dates, we do not know if they will ever have release dates. Okay, so just bear that in mind. But with that said, You've told us one of the biggest things we can do to improve gameplay is to make it a lot more responsive. So we are taking up that challenge. We are exploring ways to eliminate lag from RuneScape. This so is really this cool. Prototype here, Check this out. The instant you click on the ground, your character starts to move. There is no delay. There's no waiting for a message to go from your game client to the server and back and that's because this system is predicting your path, moving you instantly, and the server and client synchronizing as they go. Now, if you look at the debug on the screen, you can see these green boxes. The one that's under the player character represents <coughs> where the client has your position. The one that's trailing is where the server says you are. And the gap between these two green boxes represents the lag that comes from your internet connection and the speed of the game server tick. And that is the gap that systems like this are aiming to close. I, this is gonna be so hard to implement, but if they are able to do it, I may, I may not have to disruption shield the uppercuts anymore, you know? And that's a good thing. You know, runes are expensive, but this is very impressive, even as like a, as a hypothetical, the fact that they've got it working in this area, I think is, it's insanely cool, personally to me. I think it's really nice. You can even see the gap of, you know, the, the exact difference of where you would be in the old system and where you are in the new system. And it's a big gap in a lot of these spots where you're off and away much more quickly. So anyway, I, uh, I love this update, it's fantastic. 
Hope you're all. Thank you so much for the four months, Snuffles. I really appreciate it. Congrats on the gold gnome. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. You're a legend. Let's keep it rolling. So the last prototype is arguably a quest for our quest for the Holy Grail, a faster server tick rate. This, as you're saying here, is the game as it is now, server tick running at 600 milliseconds. And this means that sometimes there's a slight delay between your input and then the action in the game. So if we move to see the prototype, we have added a second faster server tick system. It's actually six times faster. You can see the debug graphics representing that. What we've done in this prototype is port the core combat code to run in this faster system. It means your actions are much quicker and they're more consistent. And potentially, this sort of system could mean we could make responsiveness improvements across many actions in the game. Now, okay, so this is an interesting one to unpack because initially when they make this change, it's not actually going to change a whole lot in terms of, you know, bosses in the field of the game, but it gives you the potential to do a whole lot different because if you're looking at it right now from like a, you know, a dev standpoint, everything in the game has to happen on these 0.6 second intervals. Um, that are the game ticks, you know, your global cooldown, your attack speed, it's always going to be three game ticks, which is 1.8 seconds. So just being able to have monster special attacks and effects and stuff running on these baby mini ticks, I think is, is very, very, very cool. Um, and it's something that, you know, people have been asking for for a long time where the tick system, you know, it makes dynamic PVMing very difficult to create. And, uh, I would love to see some crazy time precise things. If they can fix the, the lag aspect of clicking, um, where things are a little more responsive and then get rid of the tick system, you can make some incredibly fun, timing perfect, tick perfect, um, everything. So anyway, I'm really excited to it. People are saying, oh my goodness, rip for tick auto attacking, whatever else. Um, I, this is very much conceptual. I, I would expect that they'll be able to, if they want to make four ticking work in the system, they'll be able to do the same thing. You just might have a slightly larger window to make it work. Uh, Stefan, thank you very much for the Twitch Prime sub. <laughs> thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You're an absolute beast. All right, in we go. It means your actions are much quicker and they're more consistent. And potentially, this sort of system could mean we could make responsiveness improvements across many actions in the game. Now, we are... Thank you. <laughs> We are incredibly excited about these things on the one hand, but on the other, as we've said, as that, that warning, what we're showing you here in these prototypes is the 1% of the game we've got working and not the 99% that these experiments break. But really the important thing we're trying to share with you is our ambition for RuneScape and its game technology. We're now really having a crack at these challenges. We are exploring ways to make RuneScapes core experience, look better, feel smoother, and be much more responsive. This is just a taste of the things in our minds for the future of RuneScape's game technology, and I think they also represent the things that are now possible when we're really focusing on the NXT game client and advancing it with new features. Okay, that brings us to the end of the RuneScape Reveals Thank keynote. Cool. Thank you, Logan, for the 11 months. I appreciate it. Is this the Krusty Krab? No, it is not, unfortunately. Wish it was, but, you know, we're not quite there yet. Um, so that's the end of the keynote. Um, we've gone through every update here, and we've commented on pretty much everything in here, and uh, I think there's there's a whole lot of really cool here to unpack, honestly. I think there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff that they've come out with here today. Um, I wanted you guys to, to put in the chat right now, What's your overall rundown on this entire keynote? What do you guys think? Overall out of 10. I want to know right now. Everybody in the chat, you're welcome to, you know, put your own thing in there. What would you guys say out of 10? Um, personally for me, overall on this entire thing, on this entire keynote, I, I think I, I'm pretty happy to give it. I think I'm going to give it an 8.5 out of 10. Um, and that would be a nine and a half if, uh, I don't know, if maybe the, uh, the boss situation was coming a little sooner or something like that. But I am, I'm very, very, very pleased. And it's so cool to see what you guys think as well. I see a lot of sevens, eights, nines, even some tens as well. And, uh, that's really, really exciting to see. I think 
Overall, in terms of keynotes and RuneFest reveals, this has got to be one of the best ones yet, I would say, just in terms of how most people seem pretty excited for it. And that makes me really happy, you know, as a content creator, as a player myself, because obviously I'm a player first. I, uh, I'm really happy. Yeah, just to update every, like, overall, you're not, you're not rating what I rated things, because obviously that's going to be completely up to me. I'm sure people are going to, you know, disagree with most of the things I put in here, or a lot of them, and that's totally fair. Um, but, uh... Yeah, you're very happy with the reveals, not confident. That's fair enough. But uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm really excited. So anyway, that's my uh, my my full review of the keynote, my full rundown of everything. I hope you guys enjoyed it.